to uh, introduce this week's seminar speaker, Megan Bedell from the Flatiron Institute in Manhattan. Uh, Megan did her undergrad degree in physics and astronomy at Haverford College and then went on to the University of Chicago where she got a PhD in astronomy working with Jacob Bean. Mm -hmm. And after that, she got a postdoc at the Flatiron Institute uh, in their computation center, she can say what it is, <laughs> um, in, in New York, which seems like a pretty exciting place right now. Uh, the Flatiron Institute. Anyway, I'm, uh, oh, the other thing I was going to mention is uh, Megan is an invited speaker in the Gordon Conference this summer on Origins of Solar Systems that Alicia and I are chairing. And again, advertise people interested in any aspect of planet formation should come to this conference. So anyway, go. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm happy to be able to experience the famous lunch club. Um, so as, as Larry said, I'm currently a postdoc at the Center for Computational Astrophysics at Flatiron Institute in New York. Um, I work on uh, precision spectroscopy for stars and for exoplanet detection. And I'm personally really interested in questions about how planetary systems form and evolve, which I know a lot of people here are also working on. So the... <laughs> um, for, for many years, um, the best way to get at the origins of planetary systems was to study the solar system. And in some senses, this is still true today. We have by far the most detailed information about the planets in the solar system. But if we draw all of our conclusions about planetary systems from the solar system, um, we're limited to a sample size of one. And we may be overlooking things that happen um, not every time planets form, but in a significant fraction of systems. Uh, we started to realize this and the consequences of it when uh, exoplanet detections really started kicking in about a decade ago, um, largely thanks to NASA's Kepler spacecraft, but also ground-based radial velocity missions. Um, and soon, uh, NASA TESS and uh, ESA Gaia will be producing probably tens of thousands more planets to add to this plot. So what these planets showed us was, A, planets around other stars are common, and B, a lot of those exoplanets are um, quite different from the ones that we see in the solar system. So as many questions as these planets answer, they brought up a lot of new questions. Um, in addition to things that we had been asking before, like how do planets form? Are there other Earths out there? Um, now we have new questions like, what's up with these hot Jupiters that are gas giant planets in a couple day long orbits around their host star? How did they get there? Why do we see planets that fall into this super Earth regime where they're a little bit more massive than the Earth but a little bit less massive than Neptune in other solar systems? Um, why don't we see those in our solar system? Um, and all of these things are sort of tied to these questions about how planets form in general, what sort of range of planetary systems you can naturally get, and what processes shape these systems. So my personal motto is that um, to understand the planets that we see around other stars, we need to understand the stars themselves. And specifically, we need to observe those stars really well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is true for a few reasons. Um, maybe the most obvious one of which, uh, and these animations are not um, animated because I exported to PDF. I promise I do have a PhD. Um, <laughs> uh, but you can, you can use your imagination. Um, we can observe stars to find new planets. So these um, these static images represent uh, the, most, um, the most efficient, most productive ways of finding planets to date, which are the transit method, where we observe the brightness of a star for a long period of time and see it periodically dimming as the planet passes in front of it, and the radial velocity method, where we measure the velocity of the star along the line of sight and infer from that the orbit, the elliptical orbit that the star is taking around its, um, around its center of mass relative to the center of mass of the planetary system. Um, so in both of these cases, we really need to understand, uh, we really need to observe heavily stars, and we need to understand uh, the 
sort of the stellar astrophysics that are coming into these observations right alongside the planets. Um, in addition to this, we also need to get some extra information about the stars. Because when we look at stars to find planets indirectly, what we're actually measuring is ratios of the planet's radius to the star's radius, or of the planet's mass to the star's mass. So we need to know what the host star looks like and what its characteristics are. Because if we have no idea what the star is, we don't know if this nice planet transit signal that we picked up is a Jupiter around a giant star or an Earth around an M dwarf. And finally, we want to understand plan we want to understand stars to understand planets because stars themselves can give us clues to how planets formed and even what planets might be made out of. And so I'm going to go into that a little bit more because it's not as obvious of a point and it's really important. Um, in general, this picture that we have of how planets form is that they form side by side with a star. The same nebula um, collapses into a star and a protoplanetary disk made of gas and dust around the star. And after a few million years, um, the disk dissipates both into space and onto the star itself through accretion processes. Meanwhile, um, while the disk is dissipating and being accreted, planets and planetesimals are forming. And so the star tells us about the planets in a couple of different ways. One, whatever the star is made out of, that was the initial material in the disk that the planets were made out of. And two, there cannot even be post-processing, sort of, where the disk material that we now see on the outer layers of the star comes from the disk after some planetesimals were formed in it. And so we might even be able to use sort of subtle second order effects in the stellar abundances and compositions to tell us um, something about the history of the planetary system. So that's pretty speculative. We don't have solid proof that we can do this yet. But it requires really detailed measurements of stellar compositions. Um, from the point of view of the, uh, of the star and the planets being made out of the same primordial materials, um, this goes back to a really fundamental work in the exoplanet field, um, which is the correlation between gas giant, close-in gas giant planets and stellar metallicity. Um, so we found that stars that have more iron in them as a bulk abundance tend to be more likely to have close-in gas giant planets. And this has been interpreted in terms of the core accretion model of planet formation, where basically, in order to form a gas giant planet, especially one that's in um, a less massive, closer in part of the disk, um, you need to uh, form a gravitationally, um, you need to form a, a core of material which is made out of metals and which has a strong gravitational pull, so it's pretty massive, um, quickly before all of the gas in the disk dissipates. And so stars and disks that have more metal to start with are more able to form these cores and get giant planets around them. So this is a result that has stood up um, over the last decade, uh, although we're getting more insight into this as we see that farther out planets and Earth-like planets don't really follow this trend. Um, but this is a good example of how uh, stars can tell us about conditions in the protoplanetary disk. A possible example of how stars can tell us about post-processing effects in the disk uh, comes in this study from Jorge Melendez in 2009. Um, Jorge, who's a collaborator of mine, looked at the sun compared to a bunch of solar twin stars, or stars that are basically just like the sun. Um, and he did very precise um, elemental abundance measurements for these stars relative to the sun. And what he finds is if you plot the relative abundances of an element for the sun relative to the average sun-like star, um, and if you plot it on the x-axis as condensation temperature, the temperature at which the uh, element ought to fall out of gas and go into some um, condensate form, uh, 
uh, under the conditions of the protoplanetary disk. If you make this plot, there's a trend that is showing that the refractory materials, the elements that would go into dust um, fastest and most easily in the protoplanetary disk are relatively missing from the solar photosphere compared to other sun-like stars. So when in, uh, oh, sorry, so I should flip this over because this is the typical way of plotting it actually. Um, this was the sun relative to the average sun-like star. This is actually the average sun-like star relative to the sun, um, but same trend. So you can think of it as there are refractory materials missing from the sun's photosphere, or you can think of it as there are refractory materials added to the average solar twin's photosphere. And there's a degeneracy between those two, which I'll come back to. Um, but uh, your very own John Chambers showed that this pattern can be, um, can be uh, reproduced if you take the sun as it is today and you add on four Earth masses worth of a mixture of um, terrestrial material and uh, chondritic meteorite material. So this is suggestive that in one sense or another, we may be seeing either the processing of the protoplanetary disk around the sun where um, bits of terrestrial planet and asteroid material are being um, sort of segregated out into the disk before it falls onto the star, and therefore there's material missing on the star. Or it could be that these rocky planets form commonly everywhere, and just in other systems, they happen to be more likely to get accreted onto the host star through catastrophic events in late stages. Um, it's unclear which of these two it is, um, but this is a, an exciting peek at what we could be able to do. And I should also stress that this is a really hard observational result to get that Jorge did. It rests on only 11 stars, um, and uh, it's a super tiny change in the abundances. So we would ideally like to have more information about this to validate and interpret it. So I hope that I've shown you a little bit that the the key to understanding planets is in the observation of stars in many different senses. I also just want to point out that we have a lot of information about stars. Um, Gaia is maybe the most obvious example of this. Gaia has been observing a billion stars and has totally revolutionized what we know about the Milky Way, the solar neighborhood, our nearby stars um, and their histories and in reference to other stars. Uh, but there's also a lot of other surveys. There are many ground-based spectrograph surveys that are following up on Gaia stars. Uh, and there are many, many exoplanet-based surveys that are doing lots of photometry and spectroscopy. So the data are out there. Um, the issue often is that the data are so good that the models can't quite keep up. And so what I'm going to be talking about today in my own work is um, an emphasis on data-driven techniques, where when we want to see the smallest effects, like the imprint of rocky planet formation on a sun-like star, or like the detection of an Earth-like planet in the first place, we really need to be taking full advantage of the data that we have in hand. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, First, things related to what I was showing with that um, terrestrial planet material that may or may not be missing from the sun. Uh, and then I'm going to turn a bit to uh, another facet of precision spectroscopy, which is detecting planets with extreme precision radial velocities. And both of these are things related to data-driven astronomy that I'm really excited about the future of. So, to start with, precision spectroscopy for measuring subtle um, elemental abundance effects in stars, specifically with solar twins. A little bit of background. Um, if you're not an astronomer, or even if you are and you've forgotten this, um, here's a basically how we measure the composition of a star. You take a spectrum of it, um, ideally a high-resolution, high-signal-to-noise spectrum like these. 
Uh, and you look at the lines, you identify what uh, element or species each line corresponds to in terms of absorption in the stellar photosphere. And you figure out how much absorption is happening for the star you're interested in. Typically, we would do this with equivalent widths, which is just converting the net uh, area under the line into a rectangle relative to the stellar continuum. Um, there are other ways of doing this also, um, but this is nice because it's invariant to instrumental broadening effects. So you can do it for any spectrograph and compare it to any other spectrograph. Then once we have these equivalent widths, or the amount of absorption, um, we magically transform them into elemental abundances in the star, um, saying, I know that this much flux got absorbed at these wavelengths. Um, this is what it tells me about the number of atoms that are causing this absorption. And doing this, this function that tells us equivalent widths go in, stellar abundances come out, it depends very sensitively on um, the stellar model that we use, that is what the pressure temperature profile is, um, what physics are happening in the stellar atmosphere, um, the conditions under which these atoms are absorbing the light. And stellar model atmospheres are not perfect. They do a pretty good job to first order, but we make a lot of approximations along the way. Um, typically, we assume that it's a one-dimensional thing, so at any, any point on the stellar surface, the atmosphere looks and behaves exactly the same, which is definitely not true. There's convection happening, there's um, surface features, and if you model it in one dimension, you're not able to capture any of that physics in your model. Um, we're also assuming things like uh, everything is static, there's no evolution through time, which is also definitely not true. Um, we're neglecting things like mass loss, rotation, magnetic fields. Um, and in reality, stars are really complicated, and we don't fully understand the physics of them. So what does this actually mean for the abundances that we measure? If the models aren't perfect, we end up with systematic errors. And these are from different studies using different techniques, looking at different elements. And they all have sort of trends where if you look at stars of different types or stars that are at different effective temperatures, um, you infer a systematically different um, elemental abundance for these stars. And there isn't really a physical reason that this should be happening, at least at this amplitude. Instead, what's happening is when you look at a star of a different temperature, you're using a different um, stellar model. You're sampling your model grid from a different part of parameter space. And if the errors in your model are manifest differently for different, um, different parts of the model grid, then that means that your abundances are biased in different ways as a function of the stellar type that you look at. So in other words, Right now, we have better data than we have models for stellar abundance work. Um, a lot of very smart people are working hard on making 3D non-local thermal equilibrium, all kinds of fancy um, stellar models. But in the meantime, what we can do is take advantage of the data that we have. So this is what I work on, uh, is twin star spectroscopy. Basically, the idea for this is well, we're worried about how the stellar models are wrong in different ways across different parts of stellar parameter space. What if we just look only in one region of stellar parameter space? And moreover, when we do these measurements, what if we do them strictly differentially? So we take every absorption line in one star and we compare it directly to the absorption line in another star that occupies the same region of um, stellar physics space. It has the same temperature, surface gravity, and bulk metallicity or opacity to it. Um, it turns out that if we do that, we can kind of sidestep the model errors because even though there is a bias being introduced when you go from the absorption line to uh, the abundance, that bias is being introduced basically identically for all of the stars that you look at. Um, and by doing this differentially on a line-by-line -line basis, we can get those errors to cancel out to first order. Um, this is just showing an example of uh, kind of a test that I did using multiple solar spectra and treating them as different stars. 
Um, and we do indeed back out elemental abundances that are consistent with them being the same star at the level of um, a tiny fraction of a dex. So that's like under 1% precision. Um, for typical stars, we can obtain about 2% precision in the elemental abundances. And that's a factor of five better than we could do um, without using this differential twin star technique. So what sort of results do we get from this? Um, for my PhD thesis, I worked with this solar twin data um, from a planet search that was PI'd by Jorge Melendez. Um, so we had a ton of spectra from ESO's HARPS spectrograph. Um, we found some exoplanets with it, but what I'm going to be talking about today is the spectra that we got out of this as a byproduct of the planet search. We were able to co-add spectra of stars such that for um, over 70 solar twins, we targeted 68 stars, but when you add in some archival data that we found on other solar twins, it was about 80 stars. Um, for each of these stars, we were able to get spectra with signal to noise of a thousand or more. Uh, so in this case, the data are definitely way better than any models we could have. And we did this very strictly differential twin star um, analysis technique on them because they're all twins of the sun and we could apply this. So we found some really cool things. Um, one thing is that we're able to get at things we're able to get information about the evolution of the Milky Way galaxy in the solar neighborhood by looking at how the abundances of different elements change with stellar ages. Um, so you don't need to worry about all of the details, but this just shows you uh, kind of an overview of how elements that are formed through different processes change with the age of the galaxy in very different ways um, because of uh, the different supernovae, AGB stars, things that are producing these elements have different time behavior. Um, so this puts some pretty strong constraints on galactic chemical evolution models, which is very relevant in this era of Gaia. We also wanted to look at things relevant to planets. So one question that we had going in was how do ratios like carbon to oxygen or like magnesium to silicon how much do those change from star to star? Because there's an idea in the exoplanet field that depending on what the primordial materials are that the planets are made out of in particular ratios, particularly these, um, it sets the type of rocky material that would form in a terrestrial planet. It sets characteristics about the atmosphere of the planet. So we wanted to know what sort of range of primordial materials can you have? What we showed is that at least for this sample of sun-like stars in the solar neighborhood, it's actually a really tiny range. So the, um, the gray points in the background are what previous studies had found, and you can see that there was a really wide spread. Um, we find the blue and red points here, um, which is basically showing you that if, if you take this naive approximation of the primordial material equals the planetary composition, um, all planets in the solar neighborhood would basically be made out of the same materials. We know that's not necessarily true. There are terrestrial planets in the solar system that are made out of different rocky compounds than each other. Um, but this puts some constraints on the sort of model parameter space that we can explore when doing planet formation modeling. Yeah, uh, good question. So these are um, the stars that we picked out as being of kind of a different population, these are the older stars that are alpha enriched. Um, and they're, they're mostly just uh, separated out here because they were the ones that we did not fit these models to. Um, so it's not super relevant. But yeah, you could potentially have old like halo-like stars would have very different magnesium to silicon ratios. Um, and could have different types of planets around them. Good question. Yeah, it's, um, it's from isochrones. So we have very precise effective temperatures and surface gravity measurements, again, from this differential technique where we're directly comparing iron lines of different ionization states to each other. Uh, and with those, we can place them onto an isochrone grid. 
And we do tend to trust those isochrons, particularly because they're solar twins and the grids are tuned to reproduce the sun. Um, so they seem to be pretty good age estimates. And this wouldn't be possible for all stars, but in the future, hopefully TESS's asteroseismology and gyrochronology will help us expand this to other groups of stars. Um, finally, one question that we went into this asking was, uh, remember this plot from Jorge's paper. Does this hold up to a larger sample size? Um, is it true that the sun might be missing refractory materials or the average solar twin might be enhanced in them? Um, so we actually do reproduce this. Uh, we find that it's, it's pretty robust in the refractory elements. Um, for some of these volatile materials, it's harder to tell. Um, but these are a lot more complicated anyways. They may be condensing out in multiple forms that aren't necessarily accounted for in the condensation temperature, um, and they're harder to measure. So in this area where we have a lot of data, we do find that the sun is, um, has fewer refractory materials than the average solar twin. And to show that in another way, if I just fit a line to this um, and plot a histogram of these, this is what you get. So you see that the sun, by definition, has zero slope because it's relative to solar abundances. Um, but the average sun-like star has, um, has a positive trend. Well, it's upside down from that. Um, has a positive trend, meaning that it has more refractory materials than volatile materials. In fact, about 90% of uh, solar twin stars from our sample have a higher concentration of refractory materials than the sun does. Um, and the two different colors here are just whether or not we're taking into account galactic chemical evolution or age effects. Um, but in either sense, uh, this does seem to stand up. The tricky thing, though, is in interpreting this. So ideally, we would like to say that stars that have a certain refractory to volatile ratio um, maybe have rocky planets or have hot Jupiters and have had some sort of massive uh, migration disruption event um, that have caused them to accrete planets. Some sort of connection with the planetary system um, would really validate this interpretation. Unfortunately, it's really hard to know what the planetary system is, especially when it comes to terrestrial planet materials. So from what we have right now, uh, only a few stars in this plot have planets, and there's no clear correlation showing up. In fact, uh, Kepler-11 is one star that has a very different planetary system from the sun. It's got a bunch of very close-in um, super-Earth mini-Neptune-type planets, uh, and it falls exactly on the sun in this plot. So it's unclear if these sorts of trends are actually telling us anything about planet formation or not. But it's not something that we can really answer right now one way or the other, because we don't know which planets, which stars here have Earth-like planets. So that sort of brings me to the second application of data-driven precise spectroscopy, um, which is uh, precise radial velocities. So I mentioned that all of these co-added stacked spectra that I was using for the solar twins came from a dedicated radial velocity planet search. Um, there are actually a lot of radial velocity spectra gas out there that are taking spectra. Um, here's just a, just a sampling of them, including uh, PFS. I, I mostly just picked the ones that had good logos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's about two dozen of these spectra gas in total um, that are on sky now or being developed for first light soon. Uh, and so there's a ton of data coming from these things. Um, and they're all looking for Earth-like planets. This is Barnard Star B, a planet that was discovered recently around, as the name suggests, Barnard Star. Um, and this is just to give you an example of the sort of amplitude of signal that we're looking for. Um, it's really tiny. It's really hidden in the noise. Um, and this required adding 
data together from many different spectrographs from a long time series um, to get at this little tiny curve. Um, and this curve is 10 times the amplitude of that of an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star. So we're really wanting to push the limits of what we can do in terms of spectrograph precision in these data. And that's a data analysis challenge, uh, which I like. So again, to go back to basics a little bit, um, I just want to go over how, how are we actually measuring these radial velocities? So say that you have a spectrum. This is just a tiny subsection of the gigantic spectrum that you get out of one of these. Um, how do you know what the velocity of the star is? The classical answer is you have this line. You know it's H alpha. You know that H alpha has this wavelength. You can solve for the velocity of the star. Um, but that's not very precise. It'll, it'll do well for absolute radial velocities, but if you want to see shifts of a meter per second or smaller in these stars, you're going to need a whole lot more lines. So you could, um, you could scale this up and do a cross-correlation with a mask that selects many different spectral lines, all of which you know the wavelength where they should be. Um, this requires that you know the stellar spectrum very well. Um, this is a standard way of doing radial velocities for a lot of searches. But it can fall down, especially for stars like M dwarfs, where we don't really understand the spectrum and its features that well. So again, we're in the regime where we have better data than we have models. We have so many spectra of these stars, but we don't really have, we don't have models that live up to that standard in terms of what the stars themselves actually look like in the spectrum and where we expect to have the lines fall. So the simplest data-driven way to measure a radial velocity is pick one of these spectra and cross-correlate all of the other spectra with it. Now you're no longer getting an accurate radial velocity because you're not introducing any information about where the lines are supposed to fall in rest frame. But you are getting a very precise one um, where you're using all of the information that you have about the spectrum. You can even take an initial guess of the radial velocity, shift everything to be in the same rest frame according to that guess, and co-add them to make a spectrum that's generated from all of the data that you have in hand. Um, so this is closer to what uh, something like PFS does, which is typically um, take a template observation spectrum and use that for the forward modeling of the radial velocity. And it should work a lot better, especially for these tricky stars. But there's one catch here, uh, which is that this only works if all of the lines are stellar and are coming from the same rest frame, when in reality, there are some lines that are being imprinted by the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so like this line here, for example, or this one off on the side here, you'll notice that even as the stellar radial velocity shifts and the lines move around, these stay in the same place, and that's because they're from the Earth's atmosphere. So how do we deal with this, particularly as we're moving to using infrared spectrographs, which are going to have a lot more of these atmospheric telluric lines? Um, this is what I've spent quite a lot of time recently working on. Um, and I came up along with collaborators with a, a simple data-driven way of extracting radial velocities in the presence of telluric lines. Um, basically. The, uh, the spectrum that you observe is um, the stellar spectrum and the telluric spectrum combined. Those things are moving with large velocity shifts relative to each other um, simply because of the barycentric shift of the star throughout the observing season, if nothing else. Um, so if you have a model in which you have free parameters being the underlying stellar spectrum and the underlying telluric spectrum, and the radial velocity of the star. That's a lot of free parameters. It's a few thousand for each of the template spectra, plus however many radial velocities you want. But we have way more data than that even. You can actually constrain this super simple model. Um, and so that's, that's what we did. I implemented this model. Um, I even took it one step further and implemented a time variability 
term for the tellurics because the atmosphere is changing with time. Um, so we're not only scaling by the air mass of the observation, which is known, but we can also add on a, sort of a, a PCA-like function where you're taking a few representative um, basis vectors that can get added with different weights to reproduce what you observe at any given time. So I applied this um, pretty basic model to HARP's archival data. Um, and this is how it does. It works pretty well. So black are the data points, red is the stellar template, and blue is the telluric template. And you can see that some of those lines that I was pointing to earlier um, do get reproduced in the telluric model. And we're even able to pick up on smaller telluric features that we wouldn't have been able to pick out by eye in the data. Um, so, do we trust these models? Uh, there are a lot of free parameters there. Um, I, in implementing this code, um, I did a lot of things to avoid overfitting, like using regularization on the model. Um, but it's not perfect, so I wanted to do some tests. The thing that really convinced me that this was working is uh, these are totally independent analyses of different data sets, one of which is the sun-like star, 51 peg, and one of which is the late M-dwarf Barnard star. Um, so these data sets were fit completely independently without talking to each other. Uh, and the underlying stellar spectra are super different. The radial velocity behavior is quite different. But the telluric model that you get out at the end is exactly the same for the two. So this was a really nice validation of this technique, I think. Um, and you can notice that it works at very different signal-to-noise ratios also. Um, the 51 pegs typically had signal-to-noise of 100 or more, and Barnard star typically had signal-to-noise of 20 to 30. But we had a lot of these spectra, so it was still OK. Um, the other question, of course, is do the radial velocities work? And they seem to. Um, we're able to reproduce the HARPS pipeline radial velocities. Um, in some cases, I think we have slightly more accurate uncertainty estimates than the HARPS pipeline does. And for Barnard star, where the stellar model um, kind of fails the most, uh, we get a better precision on the radial velocities by a factor of half a meter per second, which counts for a lot in this business. So. Um, these data-driven radial velocities seem to work pretty well. And in addition to getting the radial velocities, we get really nice um, naturally co-added spectra, um, which we could have done by hand. But this way, uh, we incorporate the uncertainties on the radial velocities of the spectrum and get this very self-consistent, beautiful, high signal-to-noise spectral model out. Um, so this is useful also for my, for my other work in stellar abundance measurements. This is for Barnard star, where you can see what I mean about our models not being so great. Um, the theoretical models do not really reproduce the data, uh, but the data-driven model does a pretty good job. Uh, so all of this code is available as an open source Python package on GitHub. Um, the papers on archive should be published soon also. Um, and I, I hope that this is kind of the future of exoplanets, to go towards open source um, data-driven analyses, because I think that there's a lot of promise there. So just to wrap up, um, I want to talk a little bit about the future of stellar spectroscopy and of exoplanet studies and how we can sort of take these sorts of things further to really find small planets around stars and understand the stars um, better. As I mentioned, Gaia is kind of the leader of big data in stars. Gaia is observing a billion stars. Um, and it's got a lot of associated ground-based missions like Gaia-ESO, um, GALA, Apogee, things like this are all targeting many of the brightest stars in Gaia to get spectroscopic parameter guesses for them. Um, the combination of these two things means that what I was showing you earlier with identifying the solar twin stars and then following those up, this is suddenly becoming way easier 
So to get that solar twin sample of 80 stars in the beginning, um, what we did was we used Hipparchos colors and magnitudes for the stars to identify a starting guess. And then we went to Mike on Magellan and took spectra of the stars um, and used those spectra to see what the effective temperature, surface gravity, metallicity were to verify that they were indeed twins of each other. And only then did we pour five years worth of observing time into following up these stars and looking for planets. These days, instead of waiting a full observing cycle and taking up a couple nights of mic time, um, we could just do that in a day based on the databases that are available online. And this is a little example of a color magnitude diagram for stars that have a lot of observations publicly available in the HARPS archive. Um, so these days, you can go across the HR diagram and pick some little chunk of parameter space that you're interested in for stars. Um, and you naturally find twin stars that you can identify through Gaia and spectroscopic surveys, but then have publicly available archival data. And you can get a beautiful spectrum of them and run it through an open source code and um, have, your, have your planets and your uh, stellar um, your stellar spectra just fall out. Uh, so this is super promising. Um, as I mentioned also, there are a ton of spectrographs going online. Uh, I'm going to assert based on a back of the envelope calculation that we're going to be getting 500 spectra of these super high signal to noise, super high resolution quality every single night pretty soon. Um, so that's a lot of data. and. There are a lot of things that we can do with these, uh, not only the twin star abundance studies, um, studies of abundances of stars that are maybe interesting because Gaia has identified interesting things in their dynamics, and of course, finding planets with them. Um, so radio velocities are a really good way of giving us um, short to medium period planets. Um, we're also getting a ton of new planets from TASS, uh, which I really didn't have time to go into this, but I wanted to give a little uh, teaser sneak peek of a paper that will be coming very soon to archive led by Adina Feinstein, uh, who's a really excellent master's student at UChicago. Um, she wrote an open source pipeline to get a photometry of test stars from the full frame images. Um, which are not officially supported by the pipeline. Um, so by the end of the two-year test mission, that'll be about 25 million stars that she'll produce photometry for, giving us rotation periods, short period planets, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, there's a ton of information coming about stars. And I hope that I've convinced you that the the future of using these observations uh, to a large extent lies in doing very precise studies to try and get at these tiny effects that we want to see. And to do that, um, we can use data-driven models. Even in places where our physical understanding fails right now, we can sort of self-calibrate from these large data sets and get at really interesting anomalies and trends that we see. Uh, and the future is looking pretty good for this stuff. So thank you very much. Thank you, Megan. Are there questions for Megan? OK, I think I have to give you the mic. <laughs> that was a great talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was very clear and, and well done. Um, so one of the things that you've said over and over again, right, is that in order to understand planets, we need to observe the stars. Um, and that seems uh, very accurate. But then in your latest, in your 2018 paper, you showed that the magnesium silicon ratio, for example, of all these stars are exactly the same. And even in the refractory um, elements, you're showing that, you know, maybe they're not exactly like the star, like our suns, but you weren't really sure what it what it meant. And so I guess my question is, in terms of the chemistry of the planets, where do you see this going? Because we used to, I mean, as of an hour ago, I thought there was this huge range of magnesium silicon ratios in all these stars, and now you're telling me there, there isn't in, in the CO ratio as well. 
<laughs> and so I guess I'm wondering what you think the future is of understanding planet chemistry from stars is based on your research. Yeah, um, I think there's, there's a few answers to that. Um, one thing that I think is, is exciting and promising um, is using uh, the pollution of stars to actually directly measure planet compositions. And so people are doing this in studies of white dwarfs where they see planetesimals falling onto the star and leaving these very clear imprints that you can see because white dwarfs don't really have their own um, strong spectra to the extent that the sun does. We can do this also with studies of stars that are in binaries or and twins of each other. So Johanna Teske, who many of you know, has done a lot of great work on this, um, using sort of one star as a, as a primordial um, measurement and the other star as like the after picture of after a planet falls onto it. So there are things like that that can somewhat directly measure the compositions of planets from stars. And I think that that kind of thing is really necessary because, as I was saying, we know from the solar system that you can have some bulk composition of a disk that actually gives rise to all different kinds of planet types because the disk has a lot of small structure to it. Um, so I think things like that are important. Um, but yeah, I, I also think that just continuing to go forward and finding small planets around these stars and trying to really like empirically match up what, what stars look like and what their planets look like. Um, I think that, that is, that's a promising direction and it's one that we can naturally go in with the data that we're being given. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule that out yet. Uh, first of all, I'm absolutely wowed by the stock uh, so one question I had is, you mentioned that the sun seems to be lacking in refractory animal, uh, animals, metals. Uh, if the sun were to swallow the solar system in the protoplanetary phase, would that be enough to correct the difference? Do we know? Uh, I feel like you guys probably know better than me because I, I don't know I guess the big question is um, what, the, what the effect of swallowing the gas giant planets would be, because um, I don't really know what the core of Jupiter is made out of. Um, but if, if it were to swallow just the terrestrial planets and the asteroid belt and all of that, um, I think you would be getting to the right order of magnitude. But yeah, I'm, Other, I'm not an expert on this. Other quick question. Uh, you mentioned using the Phoenix models. Uh, do you use some sort of uh, prefabricated model grid, or are you actually cranking the Phoenix model to get your uh, model spectra? I, I downloaded the model grid that's available online for it. So do you get absolute radial velocities out of your pipeline as well, and how good are they? Because in principle, I think they could be very good mm. if you have good telluric. Yeah, we don't actually get absolute radial velocities um, because we're building up the stellar template as free parameters in the model. We're not giving it any information about where we expect the lines to be, and so there's no, there's no rest frame reference. But what you could do is take the stellar template that you get that template should be at the average radial velocity of the star. Um, and you could always do a more traditional analysis on that telluric cleaned spectral template to get an absolute radial velocity. And I, I haven't tried that, but I imagine it could work well. But yeah, the, the important point of the method is that it's fully data-driven and relative to the measurements that you have. It doesn't know anything about line physics. Yeah, that's a good point. It can be kind of used to self-calibrate the, the zero point of the radial velocity from that sense. 
Um, again, you still have to bring in external information because we don't, um, we don't know anything about what the rest frame wavelength of the telluric lines is. Um, and we don't, yeah, so you, you still have to bring in a zero point from some external information at some point. Um, but you can probably get closer by looking differentially to the telurics, yeah. I was intrigued by your plot of uh, composition versus age and trying to understand the significance of it. Most of those are, are relative to iron, right? So this is mm -hmm. just representing the buildup of iron with galactic chemical evolution. The one that doesn't go there with that slope is zirconium, right? Oh, there you go, okay. Yeah. So zirconium has the opposite slope. Is that just, I mean, that's the only, almost the only, well, there's gadolinium there. Why is zirconium going the other way? I mean, it's a post, you know, heavier than iron peak element, so. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so one thing is that all of these stars are within a very narrow range in metallicity. Um, so you're not actually seeing the buildup of, um, of iron that much in this. Um, zirconium is also, it's not the only element that's doing this, it's just the only one that I put on this slide. So in total we have 30 different species that are measured. Um, and I always get it mixed up which one is S process and which one is R process. But uh, one of them goes down and the other one tends to go up. Um, and so zirconium is an example of that. I guess I old, old age R, has more, yeah. Yeah, later is both, so. Right, yeah, and there's, um, there's a nice paper by my collaborator, Lorenzo Spina, also from 2018, that is kind of breaking down this behavior even more. And he sees that there's this really nice trend in terms of the, um, the slope that you get on these plots. Um, if you're 100%, if the element is produced by 100% R process, it has one extreme. If it's 100% S process, it's the other extreme. But then the elements that are produced by relative fractions of those processes actually fall on a nice line between the two. Well, if there's no more questions, let's thank Megan again. And she's going to be here all afternoon. There's still some open slots if anyone would like to add their names to the list and meet with her. <laughs>